Hopefully everyone will be able to hear me. I'm a little deaf myself, so if you want to talk to me, you can yell at me. I'm perfectly okay with that. Uh, it beats that silly hearing aid thing that I stick in my ear and it gives me ear infections. So uh, I'm sure some of you probably experienced how dreadfully wonderful uh, hearing aids can be. Uh, this is the beginning of a five-part series on the Shroud of Turin. And I'm not sure any of you thought that you could do a five-part series on the Shroud of Turin, but let me assure you that it's not even, it's a cakewalk. Uh, let me explain who I am, and, uh, and that's easy enough. I'm uh, Dr. Ray Schneider. I am a retired uh, professor of mathematics and computer science from Bridgewater College, uh, but that was my retirement job. Uh, I used to joke because you get summers off when you're a professor and you get long vacations mm -hmm. and, and that's really wonderful stuff. So I spent the last 10 years of my working life as a professor. Prior to that I spent 10 years as an adjunct professor while I was working in my other jobs. Uh, my jobs have been kind of uh, broad ranging. My background is I have a Bachelor of Science in Physics. I have a uh, master's degree, most of a master's degree in physics, and a master's degree in engineering technology. There's a long story on why I didn't finish the physics master's degree. It had nothing to do with my grades, although I, my, my wife can be blamed for at least one C. Uh, I was dating her at the time, and it was a tough class, and I decided dating her was more fun than studying, and the result was what you might expect. I didn't do as well in the class as I should have, but that's not why I, you know. But anyway, that's a long story. Uh, I'm a research scientist. I've uh, worked for the United States Navy. I've worked for uh, large industry, small industry, and academia. So um, I am a master of many trades. I should, should say I'm experienced in many things and probably a master of none. Uh, except perhaps the Shroud of Turin. I've been studying the Shroud of Turin for a long time. About 1962, I went on a religious retreat, which I was required to go on because I was uh, going to a Jesuit college at the time and all the Catholic students had to go on this retreat. So I went on the retreat and during the retreat they had a presentation that was given by a couple of uh, priests who used these marvelous glass slides. And they were glass slides made from the 1931 Henri, Giuseppe Henri photographs of the Shroud of Turin, and they were amazingly detailed. And I was just blown away. And they gave out little holy cards with a picture of the Shroud on it. And I put it in my wallet and carried it around. And whenever religious subjects would come up occasionally in conversation, you know, teenagers spend all their time talking about religion, you know. Uh, but occasionally uh, it would come up and I would say, uh, oh, have you ever heard of the Shroud of Turin? And I'd pull my little picture out and give my little talk about the Shroud of Turin that I had seen this presentation. And that's pretty much my interest in the Shroud of Turin was, you know, have you heard of this? And then in 19... Uh, 76. Uh, Dr. John Jackson and Eric Jumper, uh, who were both at that time instructors at the United States Air Force Academy, uh, made a huge amount of news discovering a 3D effect on the Shroud of Turin. And it was the first time I had actually thought, gee, you know, you can actually research this thing. You can do interesting things and study it. I hadn't really thought about that. But this guy, these research, we'll, we'll cover all of that in the course of our uh, presentations here uh, over the next several weeks. Um, the 3D characteristic is a very interesting thing and we will cover that mostly next week. Um, but they showed me that you can do shroud science on the Shroud of Turin and I got very interested in doing research myself and I became a, a lecturer on the Shroud. And I've gone to many, many conferences, so uh, everything I know I learned at a conference and meeting uh, many of the people that I'm going to introduce you to today. Because today's, today's uh, topic is introductions. We're going to introduce you to the Shroud, 
we're going to introduce you to a lot of people that are associated with the Shroud. And you will hear about people who are believers that the Shroud is authentic, and we will hear about people who believe the Shroud is some sort of sophisticated forgery. And uh, we're going to dig into both of those ideas over the course of the next several weeks. So I thought it might be fun to have you introduce yourselves a little bit, or at least tell me why you're interested in uh, the Shroud of Turin. So perhaps we can go around and uh, you can just say a few words uh, who you are and maybe a question you might have about the Shroud of Turin that we can, so I can have these in my head and as we come to different things, we'll touch on those. So who would like to start? My name is Becky Driver and I just looked through the catalog and decided this was an interesting sounding class. Uh -huh. uh, had no background and no, no nothing, very little about it. So you just it. want to learn about I the Shroud? Learn about it. Yeah. Okay, well, you will learn. You'll be an expert before you get out of this experience. Uh, Brenda Rice, and basically I'm in the same boat. I have a little bit I've read about it. Sort of it. heard a little yeah, bit about I'm it. I'm not sure which side I'm on. Excuse me if I'm walking around. It's because I can't hear further than about 10 feet. So. I'm Mary Wallace, and my husband is Mark Roy. And I think we're like everybody here. We just want to see him. Okay. How many here are here primarily just that they haven't, don't know very much about the Shroud and are here kind of to learn about the Shroud? Okay, so that's pretty much a summary of the, of the majority of the people here. So that, that tells me kind of where, who's, a, what do you got there? Verdict on the Shroud of Turin by, who is, who's the, who's the, who's the it's, it says based on this is Ken Stevenson and Gary Habermas. Based on what? At least one of those was a member of the Sturt team. Yeah, and that's so. probably a, okay. a believer-oriented mm -hmm. book. Yes. Uh, well, I, I will. As we touch on books, I'm going to probably summarize the books for you. I have pro almost every book that's ever been printed about the Shroud of Turin in English. Uh, this drives my wife nuts because I also have all the works of C.S. Lewis and all the works of G.K. <laughs> Chesterton and all the works of this is my favorite science fiction authors and my house is slowly sinking into the, into the, uh, the mud of Woodstock from the weight of the books which have been banished by my wife to the basement because she says that's where they belong, in the basement. Well, I've got the basement full of books now. So what is the core question about the Shroud of Turin? I think, and you'll excuse me if I sit most of the time because my left foot in particular uh, doesn't work very well and it gets to hurting if I stand too long. Um, it's either the burial cloth of Jesus Christ or it's some kind of amazing icon made by some master forger. That's pretty much the options you have. You don't really have much. And the, uh, you might have a position, but most of you sound like you're here to learn more about the shrouds. So you don't have a position at this point. Uh, and a lot of people, yes, ma'am? How about the third possibility that it's, it's... I can't hear you. How about the third possibility that it's, it's the shroud of someone who was crucified about the same time? Uh, well, the odds of anybody, we'll see when we look at the shroud, we'll see the collection of indications and marks on the shroud, and you can answer that question yourself on what the probability is that someone around the same time could have been crucified in that way. Okay, we'll touch on that. In fact, we'll touch on that today, because today we're going to be looking at the shroud uh, itself and the markings. So let's uh, let's get on with it then. The shroud is an enduring mystery. That's the theme of my my whole set of presentations. Why do I say it's an enduring mystery? Well, the main reason I say it's an enduring mystery is that everybody continues to be mystified, and that isn't just the people that are believers who believe the Shroud's authentic, they're reasonably mystified too. Because 
when you say the shroud is authentic, it's an authentic what? How did, how did this image get on the shroud? I put up some example photographs, and you can, you'll have an opportunity to look at those uh, at break time or whenever, uh, and I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. Uh, we're going to explore this mystery and all of its dimensions, or at least as many dimensions as I can think of and touch on, and that's quite a few. And we're going to try to capture the reality of the Shroud of Turin. And it's going to be a journey through stories. And quite frankly, I take the position that all human knowledge is a journey through stories. Now, the stories are of various types. There are witness stories, people who say... ...has a unique perspective, whether science... I thought I had turned that thing off. ...archaeology, arts, personal witness... See what I can do? Well, maybe it's someone. Maybe it's stopped on its own. I don't know why it's... There's... PowerPoint has this magical ability to record uh, what you're going to say, and... Uh, and uh, if, you, if you set it up right, you can leave it on a kiosk, cycling, talking. And I, was, I, had, I gave a bunch of talks at, uh, at the St. Louis conference in this, pad, this past October. And in order, they gave me 30 minutes. And I can barely open my mouth in 30 <laughs> minutes. I mean, you know. So I, in order to get, I had 53 slides. My normal slide rate is uh, two minutes a slide. So at that rate, I would have gotten through 15 slides, and I had 53. You can see I had a dilemma. So what I did is I wrote everything out, and then I checked to see how long it was, and it was 55 minutes. So that was pretty good, but it wasn't 30 minutes. So then I had to go back and recheck, and I reduced everything, and condensed it, and then typed it up, and then I gave it, and I gave it 30 minutes flat. And then you know, all my friends were amazed. So we're not going to probably make 30 minutes flat here. In fact, how are we doing here? Okay, we're, we're good. We're only 13 minutes in, and we're on slide six. That's about two minutes a slide, right? Okay, so eyewitness stories, religious stories. Okay, religious stories are almost always the stories of God's way with men. And that goes for the Old Testament, the New Testament. Uh, they are stories about the acts of God. Science stories. We're going to see a lot of science stories. Science is a story that has mathematics and analysis associated with it and a lot of observation. So we're going to look at observations and analyses that people have done on the Shroud of Turin. History stories. If this is the authentic burial cloth of Jesus Christ, where has it been for almost 2,000 years? See, that's a good question. We're going to address that question two weeks from now in a lot of detail. Uh, but uh, history stories are a story with documents, and art stories isn't coming through very well, but art stories are stories told with pictures and artifacts. And in a sense, the shroud is an art story. It's a picture that we don't know how it was made or exactly what it is and what its characteristics. But the test of a story is whether the story is true, and I think that's fairly obvious. Uh, one of the problems we have oftentimes is then if the test of a story is whether it's true, how do you know it's true? And the test, uh, and that there, there's an interesting story about that question about truth. Because there's a guy named Pontius Pilate who talked to a guy a long time ago and he asked him a question. He said, what is truth? And uh, let's see, and the answer was, uh, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Whoever comes to the Father must come through me, through me. On a more mundane level, the test of truth is whether what the story corresponds to reality. If it corresponds to reality, then it's true. And if it doesn't, it isn't. 
Now this is an interesting, uh, uh, Father Dreisbeck, an Episcopalian priest, used to use this image, and I, that's why I put it up there. This is uh, the Apostle Thomas. And Thomas is one who said, unless I see the wounds and put my fingers into his side, I will not believe. Well, that's the correspondence of truth and reality. He didn't believe the story. He didn't believe that Jesus had appeared to the disciples, so he had to be shown. And ultimately, that's this very scientific thing. So how do we know the truth? We know the truth by a number of, of dimensions. We know the truth perhaps most completely by direct observation when we see the truth. We know the truth when we take direct observations and we relate them through understandings that involve correct interpretation. We know the truth when the various truths we know correspond with one another in such a way as to convince us that we're being told a, a fabric that hangs together. So it's the coherence that it all fits together. So we're gonna, I think you should think about those tests of truth as we pursue this question. So what's the Shroud of Turin? The Shroud of Turin is a large linen cloth. The images I have here are in about half scale, which means it's quarter scale because it's half dimensions in both ways. The Shroud itself is 14 feet 3 inches long. It's 3 feet 7 inches wide. Uh, what you're looking at here is the shroud as seen from the backside. Most people have never seen the shroud from the backside because the backside was concealed by a backing cloth to help keep the cloth uh, from deteriorating. And this was removed only in 2002. The shroud is now kept in a separate container that's filled with nitrogen and passive gases uh, to protect it, uh, help to try to keep it from deteriorating, uh, mostly fading, the concern, and we'll get to that. This, so, but there are a few things that you can see even on the back side. There are these long, these, these open tears like, <coughs> and these long streaks. There's also holes The, these patches and these long streaks were created by a fire that in 1532 uh, nearly consumed the shroud, or at least certainly threatened it to the point uh, where it would have been consumed. At that time it was folded up uh, in 32, folded over and then over again, and so this was a little bit, these, these holes are a little bit like when you were a kid and you folded up a piece of paper and cut a corner. And then you opened it up and you had all kinds of fancy holes in it. Well, that's what happened. They were very fortunate that it didn't destroy the image uh, on the shroud. It only damaged it slightly. The other holes are very strange, and we'll come back and talk about them at some point. What about the weave of the shroud? Well, the shroud is a very fine linen cloth. Uh, in fact, it is a uh, for the time uh, uh, attributed to it, or any time since it's been uh, uh, first exhibited in Europe, uh, it's a cloth that would be very, very expensive and in generally would be used for apparel, not for a burial shroud. So it's an unusual cloth to be a burial shroud. It's a three-in-one herringbone twill. Uh, the individual threads are Z-twisted. Now trust me, I know nothing about spinning cloth thread or, or weaving cloth, but Z-threads, when you have a spindle and you're manually spinning threads, the spindle can turn either clockwise or counterclockwise. And the people who are expert on cloth, they call the clockwise spindle a Z-twist and the counterclockwise a S twist. Egyptian linen is predominantly uh, S twist, while the shroud's linen is Z twist. 
People who are experts on textiles say that this implies that the shroud did not come from Egypt and must have come from Syria or some place north because that's where they tended to do uh, make cloth in that fashion. It's a very fine linen in the sense that the, uh, the warp and weft are many, many threads per centimeters, 38.6 in warp. The warp are the longitudinal threads. The weft are the threads that had to be swept back and forth as the cloth was woven. And the weft's 25.7 threads per, per centimeter. And that's, of course, an average. Um, so the weave is very fine. A gentleman named Reyes uh, was given permission in 1973 to take a sample of the, shri of the shroud at a, a corner that's far removed from the image. And he took a little sample, it was only about this long and this wide, and he worked threads out of it. And that, that sample has actually featured in a lot of the, the uh, science that's been done on the shroud because as you might imagine, people don't, don't allow you to take shroud samples with any great alacrity. As a matter of fact, the people in Turin are really uh, protective. They consider the shroud sort of the, uh, the uh, protector of the city, and they don't want anybody coming in and messing with their shroud. Uh, that makes it all the more amazing that uh, in 1978, a team of about 40 American scientists were given an opportunity to study the shroud. And we'll talk about that in some detail next week. But here's the, uh, some of the statistics on the shroud. Now there are many, many markings. I mentioned two, the burns, the burn holes. Now these burn holes occur in four locations. Uh, increasingly smaller. There are scorches that are related to the burns. There are also water stains which are very hard to see in this low con. This is an uh, actual photograph with no image enhancement. What most of you probably don't realize is that every picture you've ever seen of the shroud is image enhanced. Why is that? because the image is so faint. The image is so faint that if you are present at the shroud and you get inside of three feet, you can't see the image anymore. The image, your ability to see the image depends on being far enough back that all of your vision, your peripheral vision, can integrate the what you're seeing, what's coming into your eyes, and then you can kind of see this very faint image, which has been described by the early people that saw it as kind of an amorphous, watery, almost a sweat image. And that was an explanation that people gave it some time in the past, that this was an image that Christ made by putting, this is before they, they understood it was a burial shroud, uh, and that's a story in itself, which we'll talk about in the his when we touch on the history. The patches, and of course we mentioned the complex weave. So here's what the shroud looks on the other side. You can see why I say the image is faint. And to try to give you a little bit of a uh, help, I, I equalized the image which gave this thing, and you can see that on the shroud there is the full length image of the front of a man and the back of a man, and we're going to look at this in a lot more detail uh, in the next few minutes. I mentioned that the visibility of the shroud image, um, only the only, it only becomes visible when you step back from it. Uh, when you're close to the shroud, you can no longer discern the image. This is a picture, I think, from 1998 of John Paul II visiting the shroud of Turin. What about these poker holes? These are, this is uh, those holes that I mentioned. They're, they tend to be called the prey poker holes. And, uh, 
Prey is the name of a guy who was an archaeologist who studied manuscripts, and he found a manuscript called the Prey Manuscript. This manuscript had an image on it which uh, appeared to include the holes from the Shroud of Turin. Whatever these holes, whatever caused these holes, these holes have been on the Shroud far longer than the 1532 burn holes. So these are more ancient holes that are on the Shroud. No one knows what the event was that caused these holes. They're called poker holes because some idiot, uh, and I say that advisedly, uh, claim that, well, what these holes were due to is some sort of a test of authenticity where somebody took a, po a hot poker and shoved it into the shroud to see if it was really authentic or something like that. A test, kind of like uh, when you take a witch and you put the witch in, a, in, a, in, a, in water and if she sinks, she's, she's not a witch and if she floats, she is or something. You ever read that stupid the things people did in the past are just mind-bogglingly <laughs> stupid sometimes. But if it was a poker hole, if somebody had shoved it through and it was folded over, then all four sets of holes would be the same diameter, roughly. Nobody knows what caused these. I have a theory. Understand, this is pure speculation. My theory Want to hear my theory? Yeah. I, was, I, I got. I should bring this turtle. I have a. I got puppets. And I have a turtle puppet, and he likes <laughs> to show people his trick. And his trick is that he can stick his head in, into his shell. Well, my theory about these uh, is totally without any foundation. It's purely speculative. But there are some reasons why uh, it might be true. The shroud. If you look at a at a. a a church, a Catholic church, an Orthodox church, an Episcopal church probably, uh, Lutheran churches, they put a cloth over their altar. And especially in the Eastern churches on high holy days, they put, you'll find that in Constantinople, for example, they put very elaborate cloths with images of Christ laid out in the tomb over their altar uh, in the Easter season. Now, if you had the Shroud of Turin and you thought it was the real burial shroud of Jesus Christ and a high holy day, what might you do with it? You might fold it and lay it over the altar during the high holy day mass. Now, one of the things that people do in high holy day celebrations is they use incense. And incense is created by little burning embers of aromatic spices. Now if some blithering idiot bumped this thing that and it was on the altar and knocked some of the spices burning embers off onto you can imagine the consternation because you've got the shroud on the altar and the embers and 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 they burn through the four layers of the cloth. Pure speculation. On the other hand, it sort of makes sense that whatever it was was a surface burn. You know, here's the top level, and then it, it, you fold it over to this level, and they're a little bit smaller, and you fold it over to the next level, and they're smaller still, and finally in the below the, and you can take an image of the shroud and fold it and see that, that the shroud was folded in four. And folded in four, it would be about eight feet long, and 20 inches or so wide, two feet wide, which would be just a nice size to lay on an altar. So I think that's a, a possibility. I wouldn't rule it out. Now the burn holes from the 1532 fire are here, but let me see if I can uh, show you the, uh, well I think the next, here's the, this is, whoops, let's go back. Here's the burn holes from the uh, 1532 fire. We've mentioned them. We mentioned the prey poker holes. These, uh, a gentleman uh, did a, a very detailed study and concluded that the shroud, when the, at the time the burn holes were created, was folded in this kind of a configuration, and the reliquary was exposed to a fire for a long time. It was a silver reliquary 
uh, in a, enclosing a wooden box, and he thinks that uh, something happened and the hinge fell, fell through and fell onto the shroud in this fashion, uh, as you can see right here, and made that and made those holes when it was unfolded. That was 1532. Two years later, uh, some nuns uh, were, the actually the poor Clares uh, were called in and, uh, and they lovingly patched the shroud. Now there's also water stains, and this, this image kind of tr tries to highlight these water stains. Uh, there's a whole bunch of them. And for a long time, people said, that the reason these water stains were here is they had to put water to put the fire out in 1532. <coughs> and then, the, and everybody accepted that. Seems like a reasonable thing, right? They threw water on it to, to, to end the fire. And in fact, it's interesting if you get uh, some of the books on the shroud, they have quite a, there's quite a little bit of, of history about the heroics of getting the shroud out of the burning church because it's in a reliquary that's starting to melt, silver reliquary, which means it's around 800 degrees. This is before people had walked around with asbestos gloves or anything, and these guys pulled this thing. It was locked behind like five locks. So somebody, and they couldn't find the keys, and they had to get it out. So people are in there in the middle of the fire banging the locks off the thing to get it out. It must have been horrendous. And so it was perfectly reasonable to think, well, they threw water on it, and that's where the water, until somebody came along and said, okay, yeah, that's fine, except that if the water was then the full, we know how it was folded because of the burns. Mm -hmm. So when we fold it that way, the water holes, the edges of the water stain should line up, shouldn't they? Right. They don't. Now the interesting thing to me, one of the interesting things to me, not only is it that obviously the water stains came from a different event, but the other interesting thing is how easy people are, how easily they're deluded into thinking that, well that sounds reasonable, isn't that, that's the coherence dimension of telling the truth. That's a coherent explanation, just like my embers falling on the thing. That's a coherent explanation. I have no idea whether that's how it actually happened. But something made those holes. Well, it turns out that a guy did a lot of work and concluded that the shroud was probably stored in this kind of a vessel for a period of, for a long period of time and that it leaked water and he's a, and he could actually recreate the way the shroud was folded completely different from the way it's folded uh, at the time of the fire. And he built an analog shroud, that is he made, he made a linen cloth, uh, he got a linen cloth that was the same size as the shroud. He folded it this way, he stuck it in a, uh, in a jar this way, and he duplicated the, the, the water stains. Now that's science, I really, I mean I have tremendous respect for this guy. Because everybody, you know, he, he, he spent a couple of years doing this. And, uh, and now it's, everybody now knows that, no, the water stains didn't come from putting out the 1532 fire. They came from some other event. Now I want to point you to some resources. Two extraordinarily important resources are one, www.shroud.com. Now that's Barry Schwartz's, that's Barry Schwartz's uh, shroud site. It's probably the most important shroud site in the world. And the reason for that is because he has everything. He tries to be very unbiased. He puts, he puts up articles by all the scientists and people that have worked on the shroud. He's got pictures of the shroud. Lots of stuff on Barry's website. Barry was the documenting photographer of the 1978 Shroud of Turin research project that went to Turin and did the only serious science, or at least the vast majority of the serious science, 
that's been done on the shroud. Now, Barry's cool, but another shroud site you must visit, just if you're interested in the shroud, is syndonology.org. The thing that's cool about syndonology.org is you can explore the shroud in vast detail on your own at syndonology.org. They have two of the finest images of the shroud ever taken. The 1931 Henri image and 2002 Durante image. Henri was a photographer, Durante is a photographer. But the interesting thing about syndonology.org is that you can pan the image, you can expand the image down almost to the thread level. So you can, if you're interested in some particular marking on the shroud, you can expand it and you can look it over very carefully. You can clip pictures. So if you're doing research, you can actually capture images that are about as good as any image you can find. It's very nice. Now there's another site, I think I put it on your handout, which I think is called shroudstory.com. And that's a blog site where everybody and his brother's uncle goes out and, uh, and chats up the, the shroud. There's a few very well-known skeptics that go and run down the shroud and then people come in and defend it and people attack. You know, it's kind of, if you're entertained by that kind of thing, you can have a lot of fun visiting that site. Okay, so to, now we're going to continue. Uh, Latendri, Mario Latendrisi is the guy who did uh, Symbonology.org. It's a, a it, Shroud Scope is the facility at that site. If we get a chance, I'll try to connect to the site, uh, but I didn't get a chance to hook up to the internet here, so I don't know whether it would, I don't know how long it would take, and I don't want to bore you to death with that. So let's do a quick survey of the markings on the shroud. We did the kind of the non-image related markings, uh, but basically when you look at the shroud, there's only a few kinds of things you find on the shroud. You find areas of clean, clean linen, basically places that are mostly free of any dirt and marks. You find the burn and scorch marks, which we've mentioned. You find the water stains. You find blood stains. You find something I call the banding phenomena. The banding phenomena is the fact that the shroud has, in some cases, bands both horizontal and longitudinal that appear to be due to things like the processing of the yarn lots that were went into weaving the shroud. Now that's a fascinating thing because that suggests that the shroud was made before it was a common practice to bleach an entire cloth after it was woven. In the earliest days, cloth, they didn't have facilities for bleaching things. In fact, even, even as late as, uh, I'm not sure what century, but bleach is a fairly new thing. Serious bleaches. All the bleaches going in back in like uh, Christian times and early medieval times are based on plants. And you, you took uh, plant, plants that had certain bleaching characteristics, you boiled them in water, then you put the, put the cloth you wanted to process into the water, and then you'd lay it out it was much easier to, to bleach individual yarn lots. The result of that, though, was that one yarn lot was bleached to one degree and another yarn lot was bleached to another degree. And when the yarn went into weaving the cloth, the cloth ended up having patterns of bands that were not unattractive but are characteristic of older cloth. So we'll look at that. There's also various dots and dirt. I'll try to point some of those out because some of those are fascinating. Uh, wrinkles and folds and some patches and stitching. So let's take a look at the face. This is, this, this is something I put into the presentation uh, to give you an idea of some of the things you can do. Do you see much difference between these two images? Sorry. That one's darker on the right. 
The, what about the one on the right? It's it dark. seems darker. A little darker? I don't know. The one on the right, is, the one on the left is on... Uh, is unmodified. It was clipped from Synthenology.org without any modification. The one on the, this, this one. This one is the same image but processed uh, by a computer algorithm that attempts to reduce the number of colors. And that is called an indexed image algorithm and it reduced it to 16 colors. This this has several million colors. This has only 16 colors. Other than that, they're the same image and they're based on exactly the same cutting. Now, the reason I did that is that's a little tricky thing you can do if you're interested in trying to find ways of classifying pixels. You can start by reducing the number of kinds of pixels and then you can look at, well, what do the pixels do? And this is the codes, there were 16 codes, uh, and, this is, and then I injected false color into each code to see, well, what does that particular pixel indicate? Does it indicate anything? This one appears to indicate blood. You know, it lights up the blood image on the forehead. It lights up some blood that presumably is on the mustache and on the beard, and the blood drops and some of the major blood that's in the hair. Some of the other ones don't pick up the image at all, so they're, they're not in the image area, so they're probably not image related. They're not blood related, so they're probably kind of dirty, different modeling of the cloth related. So what I did this, this is the, this, when I did this, this is just intended to be illustrative of the kinds of things people do when they're studying the image. This was done to inject to try to find out how much blood is there on the, on the front of the image. And the answer is a lot. There's blood uh, in the forehead image, there's blood running through the hair, there's blood that ran down the nose, there's bruising on the cheeks, there's blood in the mustache, there's blood. There's a lot of blood that went into this image. Is it really blood? You'll have to wait till next week. <laughs> a forensic test. Uh, we have multiple uh, uh, gospel accounts of the passion and death of Jesus Christ. So if the shroud's authentic, one of the things you'd expect was that these, the image on the shroud would contradict the scriptures. And it might, in fact, even provide some insight so we're going to look at the, uh, at the individual parts of the image to see if that test is workable. So what's the gospel event chronology? Well, Jesus was taken in the Garden of Gethsemane. He was taken to the house of the high priest. He was mistreated there. Or he was beaten around the face with both fists and a... And a, and a, a staff. Uh, subsequently, he was taken to Pilate. Pilate uh, interrogated him and decided to scourge him and release him. Uh, and he scourged him and showed him to the crowd. And the crowd said, crucify him, crucify him. Uh, he was also crowned with thorns, something that was not a very common, you know, you didn't crown anybody with thorns unless you had a reason. What was the reason? Well, the reason was written on the titulus, which was put on the cross. Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. They say you're a king. What do you say of yourself? Thou sayest it. I am a king. That's why I came into the world. Jesus was the only person, uh, certainly, in Jerusalem crucified for saying he was a king. So it'll be a little, to your question, I think the fact that you're gonna find on the shroud evidence of all the wounds that are in the gospel suggests that this is definitely the person he's being, who's being represented. Now is he being represented by a forger of some kind or is this an authentic, uh, that's a different question. But I don't think there's much doubt about who we're talking about. 
he also carried his cross, and there's likely, we aren't really told that he fell, but in tradition, there's the, and we know that Simon of Cyrene was pressed into service to carry the cross. Why? Well, obviously they were afraid Christ wasn't going to get to Golgotha in time, you know, alive if they didn't do something. So the tradition is that he fell three times, and who knows how many times he actually fell. But there's actually evidence on the shroud of wounds associated with falling. And that's interesting. He was nailed to the cross, he died, and he was pierced rather than having his legs broken uh, because he was already dead. So what about be Luke says, the men who were guarding Jesus made fun of him and beat him. They blindfolded him and asked him, who hit you, guests? And they said many other insulting things to him. The face shows bruising. There's, according to uh, Robert Buckland, who is a forensic uh, doctor who did a, uh, was interviewed on a Shroud documentary. I didn't, I thought about showing some Shroud documentaries, but I thought you guys didn't want it. You can probably get those if you're interested in them. There's one called The Silent Witness. It goes back to like many, quite a few years before the carbon date. And Robert Buckland in that talks and delivers a, a forensic uh, scientist, a medical examiner's opinion based on the image of the shroud. And he concludes that the man has been beaten and probably his cart nose cartilage has been broken. Um, what about crowned with thorns? Well, there's, there's blood pouring out of the top of the head. Now there's a, a vacant area here and there may be signs that there was something over the head when he was put uh, in, uh, in the and there is, in fact, a relic in Cahors, France, called the Cap of Cahors, which has blood on it, and is supposed to be. No, nobody is. In, I'm, I'm a big fan of trotting out all these relics and checking them out. You know, I think it'd be really interesting. We were we at this conference I was at recently. They were talking about blood testing, and there's an interesting form of blood testing called mitochondrial DNA. And mitochondrial DNA allows you to, it's not, it's, see, blood doesn't have any DNA in it normally, normal blood, because it doesn't have any nucleuses. The blood corpuscles don't have nucleuses, so it's hard to get, uh, but apparently you can get this mitochondrial DNA, and that comes from the mother. And if you found blood on like five or six independent relics and all the mitochondrial DNA matched, that would be fascinating. That would sort of integrate, say, hey, you know, ha, ha, ha. You know, everybody laughs at these things, but guess what? The mitochondrial DNA on this one and the mitochondrial DNA, you know, that hasn't happened. But I think that would be an immensely fascinating thing if it could happen. And it might. Uh, the one thing that's interesting about this is there's just a lot of puncture wounds. Now, we're commonly, we see Jesus crown of thorns represented almost like a laurel, right? You know, coming around, you know, that isn't the way it was. It was a clump of thorns jammed down over his head and, uh, and probably left there for quite a while. Why is that? Because crowns in the Middle East were large dome-shaped things. When you crown somebody, you didn't, it was more like, uh, you know, sticking a colander on their head than, uh, than some kind of little coronet. Okay, so that's an interesting thing because we know Jesus was crowned with thorns. But this crown is, is not the crown that's normally seen in art. It's a crown that's more authentic to the actual event. A large group of thorns crushed down over the man's head and it would explain the many many blood wounds and you'll be able to see those and this is the scripture as they mocked him after they put the crown of thorns they were hitting him with a stick 
which is, uh, you know, kind of that probably made sure that the thorns uh, got plenty of, uh, and, and head wounds bleed a lot. So what about scourging? The scourging, there are marks all over the shroud. And this is a, a, an attempt to illustrate the, the widespread nature of the marks, but you can, you can see them when you look at the uh, images. This is uh, Giulio Risi, who was a Monsignor in Rome, was really fascinated with studying the shroud. And he went over these things and tried to fit the, find, find examples of Roman instruments of torture that fit. And he concluded that these fit the uh, standard instrument called a flagrum. And the Romans were kind of creative. They had lots of different ways to punish people. And in fact, there's more than five or six different kinds of whips. There was a presentation in October when I was down there. There's a lady from Italy came over, and she had she had a picture of every kind of flagrum that the Romans, I think, ever used. And she had they didn't all weren't examples, but when she didn't have examples, she had descriptive text describing how these these weapons of torture worked. There are more than 120. Uh, marks like this and they're dumbbell shaped marks they show braid you know blood flows here at one end and they're separated so they're like little separated pieces of bone or metal that are attached to thongs and the man on the shroud was beaten by two men uh, one on each side you can tell that by the directionality of the uh, blows and uh, it was quite a vicious, uh, a vicious beating. Uh, this is a, uh, uh, Giulio Ricci was an artist and one of the things he did is he created, uh, tried to duplicate what the Man of the Shroud would have looked like uh, in sculpture. And one of the things he noticed <coughs> in the sculptures, and if you look at the picture that you got when you came in and look at the back, you'll see that uh, aside from these markings that are all over the back from the flagrum, from the from scourging, there are actual places where the marks appear to be obliterated a little bit or, or rubbed around. And uh, Ricci felt that that was an indication that, of two things. One, that, that Christ was wearing a tunic of some sort. He had been stripped of his clothes when he was beaten because there's marks all over. Remember, look at the, the marks are on the front, the back, the thighs, the back of the, uh, the back of, of the, uh, all the way down the back. And then they wrapped around and there were marks, there were scourge marks on the chest. Uh, and even down, you know, down all the way down to the calves. So he wasn't wearing anything when he was scourged. Then he put it, cloak on because remember they they cast lots for his cloak at the site of the crucifixion so he was wearing a tunic when he was carrying uh, what Ricci thinks is he was only carrying the crossbeam which is called the patibulum and uh, there's a whole uh, detailed description of how that is done uh, when they had a multiple people who were going to be uh, uh, crucified. They would actually attach, they'd each be carrying their patibulum, and one end of the patibulum would be attached to their ankle, so they couldn't just throw it down and run away. And the other end was attached to the person behind them, to the patibulum on the person behind them. And then they would march, and so that if, if one person fell lots of times, others would be dragged down. And now that part you can't demonstrate, but the, the abrasions across the back do reflect uh, that kind of uh, that kind of event. Here's the now this because this is an appositive and not a net, they, you can see the abrasions here and, uh, and a, an abrasion here. So they this way, but in in the negative, well, let's see, did I show it? It goes, it goes the other way. 
you always have to be a little careful when you're looking at the shroud because there's the positive view and then the negative view and the negative view reverses right and left. So you have to, it gets a little tricky. Uh, what about the nailing to the cross? <coughs> there's a profound blood wound on the, uh, uh, this is actually the left wrist. Christ was, if this is, this is the posture, but when you lay the cloth down on it and take the marking away, it flips. So now it looks like it's on the right wrist. So this looks like the right wrist, really it's the left wrist. This is the way that the man's. And there's rivulets of blood that come out, not of the palms of the hands, but of the wrists. Now that was interesting because that was uh, not the way any artist portrayed the crucifixion. But Pierre Barbet, who was a French medical doctor, experimented when he saw these images, he experimented with cadavers and he concluded that if you put a nail through the palm, it will tear away in just a few minutes, tearing through the tendons because 80 or 90 pounds pulling on that won't support a body. So you had to, you had to have some better support. There's a couple of places. Now here's an example of where everybody gets into a big argument about where did the nail go to produce this. And there's three locations that they talk about. There's a place called the Space of Desto. That's where Pierre Barbet thought it went. There is the place between the radius and the ulna, which is a little further back and doesn't, doesn't look like it's that far back, but some doctors argue and then there's a place called uh, a guy named Fred Zugaby, who was a very, very prominent uh, medical forensic uh, scientist. He he thought that the that there's an area here he called the Z area. Now his last name Zugaby, you know, not that not that that had anything to do with it, of course. And he had actually a picture of a gal that you can you can put a nail through the base of the palm that passes through this Z area and get, he was trying to get the best of both possible worlds. He could get a sort of a palm wound and a wrist wound from one nail. Uh, it works, because he demonstrated it himself. Yes, ma'am? How about the possibility of having rope that would tie, how about the possibility of rope tying around the, the wrist to aid the, the nail? Like Did what? Something tying the wrist to the cross beam. If someone did that, that would obviously give you some additional structure. I don't think the Romans bothered doing that for the most part. They didn't really care about anything, but uh, you know, they were pretty uh, well. Like, like they had a job to do. Can you imagine being a member of the Roman executioner squad? You know, they the. Uh, During the, the uh, slave revolts uh, under Spartacus, there were thousands of crosses leading onto, on the Appian Way leading into Rome. And uh, you get really bored, uh, and there's, there's accounts of the way they would crucify, uh, crucify people. They, they got very creative. Well, how about the fact that stigmata that's a good question, uh, and, but that's, uh, that's a different question, really. The stigmata, you know, the stigmata, at least in part, would, would reasonably be expected to be in places that people would honor people's veneration or perception of, of things. I mean, God isn't trying to get fidelity, necessarily. I mean, I'm not sure how you do that, but I don't know the answer to that question, but I would say that it's probably... Uh, not a not a, a matter. It's more a matter of faith. If you think that Christ, uh, I don't not I'm not saying that stigmata are psychosomatic, but I am saying that people expect what they expect, and and God probably, if I were God, I would probably help them out. Uh, <laughs> and you know, I wouldn't 
want to challenge their faith by giving them uh, funny wounds that they couldn't explain. I, what do I know? There are not that many stigmatists anyway, and most of them are probably frauds. Uh, I don't hate to say that, but I, I'm, I'm suspicious that there's a few that I think are probably legitimate. Maybe St. Francis. I don't know about Padre Pio. He, uh, they dug him up and he didn't have stigmata when they dug him up, so I, what do I know? Uh, by the way, don't tell any of the Padre Pio fans, uh, you know, I don't know. Jesus died on the cross. Uh, one of the arguments some people make for the, for the pattern of the blood, because the blood flows up and down the arms, is that the blood flows in two different directions. And some people argue that's because on the cross, your chest is constricted. And in order to breathe, you have to lift yourself up. Christ was already weakened, and, but to lift yourself up is very painful, obviously, if you've got nails through your wrists and, and nails through your feet. You're pushing to lift up. It's very painful, and, but you have to do it because otherwise you can't breathe. And after a while, you just sag. But in one lift, when you're lifted up, your arms are in one form, and when you sag back down again, your arms are in a different uh, position and that's arguably one reason why maybe the uh, the blood runs down the way it does because uh, you can't see this very well you might be able to see it better uh, but the blood comes and runs off uh, a little indifferent there's blood running this way and there's blood running this way so and uh, of course the, wind, the blood separates here. Other people are a little bit more simple minded. They say there's this little bone here. And if the blood starts flowing here and it's tilted, it's going to go one way or the other around the bone. I don't know. A lot of blood. There is a wound in the side. This is, it shows here on the left side again, there's a reverse, it's actually a wound in the right side of the man. Uh, one of the soldiers opened his side with a lance and immediately there came out blood and water. What do you mean blood and water? Blood and water. Well right now you see a lot of blood, there's a little bit of separation of, of some stuff, but if you look on the back of the image, you see that blood and serum of some kind separated and flowed across the back, presumably from the wound in the right side flowing down and then across the back. And this, this blood is here. You think you can get your car to Okay, well, I don't know if we really have a whole lot of time for discussion because I have a whole lot more. But is there any points that anybody would like to raise at this point? that we could talk, address, or questions that you have that you would like to see answered. The lady back here thought that the picture I used, she, she pointed something out I hadn't even noticed, which is that they've got Jesus strapped. Uh, I, I don't, we don't know. It's one of the things that's interesting is how little we actually know about crucifixion. And that's because the uh, Emperor Constantine outlawed crucifixion in the 300s. And nobody's been crucified by Romans since. Uh, and all we have are some written accounts of crucifixion. In fact, in Christian art, crucifixion was not represented for a very, very long time until, it had, until the memory of the actual event of crucifixion had largely vanished from the popular mind. Now it was partly because crucifixion was a punishment that was only given to the most degraded, low criminal types. And it was a horrendous punishment. It was a scandal. If you look in the New Testament, you find that, uh, you know, they talk about the fact that in the Old Testament, uh, someone is cursed who is uh, hung on a tree which is what crucifixion is. And crucifixion was, a, was definitely a scandal. So it wasn't even represented in Christian art until very late. 
And so the result is that most of the art is just artist's imagination. They don't know what was going on. We know more about it from the Shroud of Turin uh, than, uh, than they actually knew from actual crucifixions. So let's, uh, I, I want to go on and talk uh, very briefly about uh, some of the people that are in, if there is no discussion, we can go on. Uh, there's a, a very large number of people who have studied the Shroud, and what I'm going to do is introduce you to a lot of these people very briefly. And then we're going to come back to those people, to some of those people, and indeed people that I haven't introduced, in future talks uh, to see what those people have said and what contributions they have made to what has been called syndonology. Syndon, by the way, is a word that means shroud in the Greek. Okay, so syndonology is knowledge about shrouds. And um, I am sort of a syndonologist, except that I find that whole thing kind of uh, a bit pretentious. I, I'm just somebody who has studied uh, the Shroud of Turin for a long time and then continue to be mystified by it, so I, I try to share my mystification with other people. Uh, so what are, what are kind of people? We're going to skim through some of the people we're going to be seeing later. Remember we, we mentioned witnesses, we mentioned artists, historians, scientists, all these kind of people, medical people, for example. So here's, uh, here's probably one of the most uh, interesting people, if you're interested in the Shroud, you need to get to know this guy, Ian Wilson. Ian Wilson is a historian, and uh, you've got one of his books. Uh, in fact, Ian Wilson's book, The Shroud of Turin, this one here was published in 19, I want to say 78, and was one of the first books on the Shroud of Turin that I ever read. And he just kind of dragged me in, kicking and screaming as I read this book. I'm saying, this is really fascinating stuff. And he has uh, done many, many uh, books on the Shroud. Uh, as time has changed and more has been learned about the Shroud, Ian Wilson can be counted upon to update and put out another book that covers the latest stuff. That doesn't mean that the older books are, are out of date, but it does mean a lot of times he finds new stuff, new perspectives, things. And so the result is he's written a lot of books. This is just a couple that I found covers from the pop-up. I have all of them. Uh, I really enjoy his books. Uh, and he, I, I really owe to Ian, a debt to Ian Wilson for some of the uh, not only some of the knowledge, but some of the fascination that he, he motivated in me. Uh, probably the most profoundly important individual scientist on the Shroud of Turin is John Jackson. He runs a Shroud Center in Colorado, which you can visit sometime. This is his wife, Rebecca. John, I call John the Pied Piper of the Shroud of Turin. He was the leader of the Shroud of Turin research project. John, whenever he met anybody that seemed like they might be interested in the Shroud, John would pull out a picture and show it to them and start talking to them about it. And before you know it, he was on the team. You know, and he just collected and he led the 40 scientists or so. And these are these are not these are scientists from major operations.